Well, thank you, Mario, very much, and good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for giving us a little time to get into your lunch periods to uh, discuss a little bit about uh, li lipids and lipoproteins. And I'd like to start with a reminder that, geez, probably starting in the 1970s, the United States has been consumed with what many have called cholesterol phobia, the new national disease. And, and it's still obviously talked about an, an awful lot nowadays. You see a Time magazine cover commemorating uh, one of the uh, most famous cardiovascular surgeons in the United States history, and that would be Dr. Michael DeBakey. And very interesting, and remember, this is a guy who's probably done more coronary bypasses and more uh, cardiovascular operations than almost anyone. Uh, we see this little announcement. In 1987, Dr. DeBakey and his team announced that high cholesterol levels, long thought to be one of the major causes of heart disease, were in fact not related to how quickly arteries become blocked. And he's talking about, of course, measuring cholesterol in the bloodstream. Obviously, if you biopsy a, a, an artery with plaque, there's plenty of cholesterol uh, in it. So what's going on here? And uh, was Dr. DeBakey correct that there are uh, downsides to just uh, making the whole ball game totally dependent on cholesterol measurements? Well, a little bit of uh, biochemistry and physiology of lipids before we get going. And in all my diagrams today, blue will represent triglycerides. Yellow circles will be free or unesterified cholesterol. Yellow circles with an orange tail sticking out is cholesterol ester. That just means a cholesterol molecule to which a fatty acid is attached. And of course, the little brown dots with two legs, phospholipids. And if you notice three oil droplets that are circulating in this artery, you see the phospholipids and free cholesterol are on the surface. And that's because they're a little bit more soluble with the water in plasma. But the incredibly hydrophobic lipids, triglycerides and cholesterol ester, are within the core of these uh, lipid droplets or oil droplets as I refer to them. Now, those things could not circulate in plasma because oil and water don't mix. But of course, we do know lipids are trafficked in our plasma. And that's because collections of lipids, these oil droplets, are wrapped with large surface proteins that confer some uh, aqueous solubility to these particles. And a group of lipids that is wrapped by a protein, and the proteins that wrap them are called apoproteins or apolipoproteins, you're looking at several lipoproteins. And of course, lipoproteins have been separated by a variety of technologies, the first being ultracentrifugation, where they got their names. If they floated, they were very low density. If they sunk to the bottom of the centrifuge tube, they were high density, and those in between were low density. Also, take a quick look that the protein in wrapping the LDL and VLDL particles is called ApoB, short for apolipoprotein B. And the protein depicted in red here wrapping the high-density lipoprotein is ApoA1. And we'll revisit those terms as we go on. But the main part of this story is lipids go nowhere in human plasma unless they are trafficked with inside a lipoprotein. So if cholesterol is going to wind up in an artery wall causing plaque, it's going to be a lipoprotein that traffic the sterols into that artery wall. As if this isn't complicated enough, understand that these particles are quite dynamic and they're constantly changing virtually every second of every minute of every day. We have specific lands for lipid transfer proteins that facilitate the transfer of cholesterol ester for triglycerides. LDL and LDL can send its triglycerides to it. Uh, HDL and LDL can send its uh, cholesterol to a VLDL, but to an LDL, and keep that in mind. So if you're looking at LDL cholesterol, understand that every LDL particle, every HDL particle in your body has a slightly different composition, and that core composition is continuously changing. And this might be one downside to doing cholesterol measurements. Does it really reflect what's going on physiologically? 
So of course you see an arterial wall with some plaque there and you see lipoproteins, ApoB containing lipoproteins leaving the plasma, passing through the endothelium, often through gaps that have been created in dysfunctional endothelium and well, they are oxidized and internalized by mono, uh, monocytes turned macrophages and you create foam cells. So the probability that a particle's cholesterol will be delivered to the plaque, basically we now know depends on particles there are. It is not as dependent as we used to believe on the size of the LDL or how many cholesterol molecules that LDL particle is carrying. It's particle number that drives these ApoB containing particles into your artery wall. And you know we can measure LDL particles, ApoB measurements. So when you get the lipid profile, I mean some of us look at total cholesterol of course, but most zero in rather quickly on what is the LDL cholesterol level. And you know that's acquired the name bad cholesterol. Uh, but I'm going <laughs> to tell you, be careful using that term. What if a liver LDL receptor grabs an LDL particle and pulls that particle into the liver? The liver will then do things to get rid of that cholesterol. So why not every cholesterol molecule in an LDL is bad? It's bad if the LDL crashes the artery wall, but I don't know that LDL-C is our best marker to tell me that that LDL is going into the arterial wall. So when you see LDL cholesterol, understand laboratories either directly measure it, as is done at True Health, or most of them calculate it using something called the Friedewald formula, which is based on triglycerides, and it loses great accuracy as triglyceride levels start to go up. Uh, and it's why you've told LDL cholesterol needs to be done fasting. The directly measured LDLC does not have to be done fasting because it's not related to your triglyceride level. So LDL cholesterol simply refers to the mass the weight of all the cholesterol molecules that is carried in every LDL particle that exists in a deciliter of your plasma. Now the calculated LDLC also includes the cholesterol that are in your intermediate density lipoproteins. Directly measured LDLC does not look at IDL particles. Not shown here, but realize, especially in patients where it might be elevated, any patient who has increased LP little a, LP little a particles contribute to your LDL cholesterol value. Here is the problem with LDL cholesterol. And we notice from a gigantic study of over 130,000 folks who were admitted to the hospital because of an acute coronary syndrome or when they came in for whatever reason, their history included that they have existing coronary artery disease. And look at this. Over 50% of these people with absolute coronary atherosclerosis had an LDL cholesterol below uh, 100 milligrams per deciliter. I, I think 13% had an LDL cholesterol less than 70 milligrams per, uh, of cholesterol. Among those who came in without a history of CAD, that means these are acute coronary syndromes, 42% uh, had an LDLC less than 100 and 13% less than. So you, you might ask yourself, uh, how, how do they even have coronary disease with numbers like that? Is this our best biomarker? Is this the best we can do? Miss half of the people? Of course, the next thing you probably look at in a lipid profile is the high-density lipoprotein cholesterol. Again, commonly referred to as good cholesterol. I'm going to shoot that down big time, and you should stop using such adjectives with this. Uh, HDL cholesterol refers to the total cholesterol content of all the HDL particles that exist in a density of your plasma. That's it. It tells you nothing else about a high-density lipoprotein. And remember those lipid transfer proteins I told you about? A huge amount of the cholesterol within your HDL particles gets transferred right over to the LDL particles. And you would say, why would that be done? Why would you want to take cholesterol out of a supposedly non-atherogenic particle and shift it to an atherogenic particle. But think about this. If the LDL particle is going to be cleared by the liver, 
the LDL is actually taking cholesterol from HDL and returning it to the liver, and the LDL is heavily uh, involved in the reverse cholesterol transport process. So again, if an HDL gives cholesterol to an LDL, does it instantly become bad? Not if that LDL is returning it to the liver, but yes, if that LDL is taking it into the artery wall. And our best marker right now to know where an LDL is going is LDL particle count, of course, or apolipoprotein B. So understand that these lipoproteins interact with one another and they're very tough to look at independently and the cholesterol measurement within the particle tells us way, way, way less than we used to believe. This is one of the reasons why HDL cholesterol is no longer a goal of therapy because it doesn't tell us much uh, about whatever an HDL is supposed to be doing. In fact, you do know, of course, when you look at an HDL cholesterol, it is gender dependent with males having approximately 10 milligrams per deciliter less than the females in a given population with individual variants, of course. Uh, and again, it's just a measure of the collective cholesterol content of all your HDL particles. But understand this, HDL cholesterol is not a measure of HDL particle count. No more than LDL cholesterol is a measure of an LDL particle count. The two may correlate HDL cholesterol and HDL particle count, but in many people they have no relationship to one another. So how would you know that if you're not measuring both of them? This is so absolutely true. We erase all the stuff you've been taught. HDL cholesterol tells you nothing about the complex reverse cholesterol transport process. Nothing. There are people with high HDL cholesterol who have virtually no reverse cholesterol transport and people with extremely low HDL cholesterol who have fine reverse cholesterol transport. So don't even use the term reverse cholesterol transport when you're talking about HDL cholesterol. Now you know there are numerous studies starting with Framingham that has showed that well low HDL cholesterol is certainly an independent inverse predictor of cardiovascular risk and you know for a while we all believe that is true. Right now you can erase that word independent because back in the day when trial after trial seems to suggest ah Nothing's better than low HL cholesterol in predicting risk. Virtually none of those studies were adjusted for biomarkers that were not available back then, but are routine nowadays. And specifically, I'm talking about LDLP and ApoB, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, also understand that because of multiple trials where patients in a randomized fashion took an agent that raised HL cholesterol versus a placebo, there has not been a single randomized blinded perspective trial that enforces or uh, proves that raising HDL matters. It has been removed as a goal of therapy in virtually every existing lipid guideline. So you no longer have to lose sleep when on a follow-up a patient comes back and still has low HDL cholesterol, provided the markers that do correlate with outcomes have been attacked and normalized as best as possible. HDLC is not a goal of therapy, so you don't have to start thinking, how do I raise it? I mean, outside of lifestyle, of course, but not drugs. You're no longer prescribing drugs to affect HDL cholesterol. How about HDL cholesterol in that giant study of 136,000 folks being admitted to the hospital with atherosclerosis? Well, you see in red, 55% of them did have a low HDL cholesterol, less than 40. But what does that tell you? 45%, almost half, had a normal HDL cholesterol level. So again, I, I can't use a biomarker, if there are better ones, that has 50% you know, sort of accuracy. I'd like to do better than that. So. It looks to me like HLC is no better than LDL cholesterol. Yeah, I'll identify some and I'll miss an awful lot. Robert Rosenson, the author of this recent incredible review, is a world expert on high-density lipoprotein. And he notes in this review is that there is no association between HDL cholesterol and CVD events in patients treated with high-intensity statins which is consistent with observational trials that have shown that. 
and you have to have a trial where indeed HDL cholesterol has been adjusted for atherogenic lipoproteins, meaning the LDLP or ApoB. Once you adjust for them, HLC disappears as having meaning. Genetic epidemiologic studies, nowadays called Mendelian randomization, shocked the world when it shows, you know what? We always used to think how causal low HDL cholesterol and protective high HDL cholesterol is with atherothrombotic events. No risk relation, no relationship whatsoever as far as causality. So uh, there are people with low HDL cholesterol, and when you look at their, uh, identify them by their genes and populations, they don't get increased heart attacks. And there are people with high uh, HDL cholesterol who are not cardioprotected. So another old, commonly religiously held belief flies out the window. Clinical trials with pharmacologic therapies I've just mentioned have failed to support HDL cholesterol as being a good follow-up metric telling you what a therapy is doing or not doing. And that's why it's no longer a goal of therapy. And this shocks a lot of people who used to study HDLs at a more advanced level. Uh, you know, you, there are small, intermediate size and big HDLs. Small HDL particle concentration is associated with lower risk of recurrent CV events in men with a prior MI, whereas large HDL particle concentration is associated with higher risk. For the longest time, we were told just the opposite was true. And uh, so understand, uh, be careful what you think about HDL sizes, how you can use that, but if you are using it, small ones are seemingly less associated with bad stuff than the big ones are. You can also measure large HDL cholesterol. It's called HDL2 cholesterol. And its major use is, if low, it's a marker of insulin resistance. And that's the only re the reason you use that test. And that's valuable information because it supports uh, nutritional therapy, but don't run around saying anymore the big HDLs are protective and the small ones are not. Total HDL particle concentration, I'll show you some really cool data, is a more robust biomarker of cardiovascular risk than is HDL cholesterol. So if you do want to have an HDL metric that you can use with a little more validity than HDL cholesterol, it's going to be HDL particle count. And the only way that can be obtained is doing nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR studies. So let's look at triglycerides now. I think you all know total cholesterol is the cholesterol content of every life in the desolate of your plasma. Well, triglycerides is sort of similar. It's the triglyceride content of every lipoprotein in your plasma. Now, in most people who don't have triglyceride-rich disorders, the majority of triglycerides will be trafficked in your VLDL, or very low density particles. But we're not really ever taught that. You know what? LDLs carry a certain amount of triglycerides, and so do HDL particles, albeit small. But imagine this scenario. You have a patient whose LDL or HDL triglyceride content is increased. Well, those particles can only carry so many lipid molecules. So if LDL or HDL trigs are up, guess what? LDL cholesterol is going to be reduced, as is HDL cholesterol. Wow. And you all know our diabetics don't always have the highest LDL cholesterol, and many of them have uh, decreased HDL cholesterol. And in large part, that is due to the LDLs and HDLs pathologically carrying more triglycerides than they should be. And they do that at the risk of not carrying cholesterol. Looking at the epidemiologic data with triglycerides from that same study of 136,000 folks, uh, this is the distribution of triglycerides in all of these people with coronary atherosclerosis. And sure, some of them had really horrific levels of triglycerides, but the extreme minority, to be honest, the typical triglyceride level of a patient with known atherosclerosis is somewhere between 70 and 170. And for the most part, many clinicians don't blink an eye when a triglyceride is in that range. So if my triglyceride is 110, how do you know whether I'm going to get coronary disease or not? 
You don't know unless you check other biomarkers that can answer that question more clearly. And it's basically going to turn out those with high triglycerides and increased ApoB or LDL particle counts get the atherosclerosis, and those with elevated triglycerides without concomitant increases LDL particle counts have far lesser coronary risk. Finally, the new kid on the street, non-HDL cholesterol. More and more guidelines are incorporating this into it, and they prefer you base uh, uh, certainly your therapeutic goals on non-HDL cholesterol rather than LDL cholesterol. And what is it? It's simply the cholesterol content of every ApoB-containing particles. ApoB-containing particles are not HDL particles, hence non-HDL cholesterol. It's a simple calculation, total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol. And it doesn't require fasting. So it's like a direct LDLC. And that makes it easier for you because you can do these lipid profiles all day long. And as long as you're zeroing in on that parameter or direct LDLC, those are your lipid cholesterol measurements that can help you. And non-HDL cholesterol has a little bit more correlation with risk than is LDL cholesterol. So if you have to do lipids, that's what you really should be looking at. But here's some bad news. The most strict non-HDLC goal of therapy in current guidelines is, and it's for the super high-risk person, get it under 100 milligrams per deciliter. Well, here's a study of over 1,200 diabetics uh, who had a non-HDL cholesterol less than 80. That's a spectacular non-HDL cholesterol level. And look at the LDLP distribution. Wow. Almost 25% of the patients with a spectacular non-HDL cholesterol level still had an LDL particle count. So how would you possibly know that if you weren't both doing a lipid profile and an LDL particle count? You wouldn't. And one would suspect that people with an LDL particle count above 1,000 animals per liter are still at risk for coronary vascular disease, it's certainly what the literature would suggest. So let's look at the lipoprotein panel that comes to you when you uh, uh, order your testing at True Health Diagnostics. And let's see we're in on some of the lip, uh, lipoprotein reported parameters. And the first one, right on top, is apolipoprotein B. And I've shown you a picture of all the various sized ApoB particles, VLDLs, IDLs, and LDLs. Why are the LDLs blinking? They have a half-life of three to five days. The half-life of a VLDL and IDL is a few hours. So 95% of a person's ApoB particles are LDL particles. Understand ApoB is just another LDL particle count. Understand ApoB tells you nothing about how many ApoB particles, meaning VLDL particles, are present. So don't use ApoB as you think you're assessing VLDL particles or even remnants. It's not a marker of those particular uh, lipoproteins. Now, LDL particle counts at True Health are done using nuclear magnetic resonance but it's better than perhaps you know. There are actually two generations of NMRs. We've been using the one for goodness 15 years or more, 20 years, and that's the first generation or 400 megahertz spectrometers. The brand new ones that have been around just about two years now, and True Health has the only collection of these machines in the United States, are much more powerful using 600 megahertz resolution. And you just are going to wind up with more accurate LDL particle counts. There are many other attributes of the second generation machine that make it more accurate also, but that's a lecture for another day. And you see a little picture of what the NMR apparatus looks like here, and you also see a ladder in front of it, and that's a uh, six-foot ladder, so that shows you the uh, size of these uh, spectrometers. But they do report to you LDL particle counts in nanomoles per liter, small LDL particle counts in nanomoles per liter, and HDL total particle counts in micromoles per liter. You didn't know it, most of us have about 18 times more HDLs than we do LDLs. One last caveat, you see the LDLP is 1816, 
that does not mean there are 18, 1,816 LDL molecules in a given volume. That's 18, 16 nanomoles. You're looking at quadrillions of LDL particles if you convert uh, nanomoles to particles. Uh, another uh, metric you get, in addition to total LDLP, small LDLP, is SDLDL cholesterol, the amount of cholesterol traffic within your smaller LDL particles. Now, using the NMR, you see large LDLs, medium, and small. Small LDL refers to the medium and the small LDL particles, and historically, we've been told they're the potentially more atherogenic for a variety of reasons. The number one reason is people who have smaller LDLs have incredible LDL particle counts, and it's particle number, not particle size, per se, that's driving these particles into the artery wall. Uh, people with FH have virtually all large, fluffy, buffy, buoyant LDL particles, but they have a ton of them, and they get terrible heart disease with their big LDL particles. The most proper use of SDLDL cholesterol is it's a great marker, if abnormally low, to let you know insulin resistance is present in this patient. And that's one where you know you have to get the nutritionist involved and attacked with lifestyle measures, and you will improve that parameter. And as you do, you're going to be improving LDL particle counts. So total LDLP, which is reported, is actually the sum of large and small LDLs FYI. A little bit of a discussion, uh, what they call a roundtable that was published in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology last year. It's great reading. Virgil Brown, founder of the NLA, uh, editor of the Journal of Clinical Lipidology, world, world renowned lipidologist for too many decades. And he's having a conversation with another top lipid lipoprotein therapy in the world, Alan Snyderman of Montreal. So Virgil says, Dr. Snyderman, do you think it's time for us to simplify this issue and give up on LDL cholesterol and simply measure ApoB? He also asks, will this measure also cover the added information that a clinician can get from looking at non-HDL cholesterol, especially in patients with elevated triglycerides? Maybe you're going to be surprised with how Snyderman responds. Al, he says, Virgil, you are so right. The debate has gone on for so long, but in my view, the debate is over. Or at least it's over to the extent it is decided by science. To the best of my knowledge, NMR gives the equivalent information as ApoB, and so I regard NMR as the equivalent acceptable technique to measure LDL particles. So Alan says, hey, you've got to have an ApoB, you've got to have an LDL particle count. But Virgil says, is it always important for a physician to know the ApoB before he or she starts therapy under all circumstances? Here's Dr. Snyderman's answer. Absolutely. LDL cholesterol is not adequate. Non-HDL cholesterol is not adequate. As I mentioned previously, a substantial minority of those with elevated cholesterol have a normal ApoB, and they are not at high cardiovascular risk. Non-HDL cholesterol doesn't avoid that error. Moreover, without ApoB, we would never diagnose the remnant lipoprotein or type 3 disorder. We used to rely on ApoE genotype for that, but we now know type 3 is not limited to ApoE2. It can be seen with 2, 3, or 4 alleles. If there's a specific formula that incorporates ApoB, and it's basically the only way you can now make that diagnosis. Dr. Snyderman goes on to say, as the amount of cholesterol in these particles can vary substantially and that there are a large number of people with markedly increased number of particles but whose cholesterol levels are quite unimpressive because their individual particles contain less cholesterol than the average person in the population. Because the number of particles is increased, they are at higher CV risk but their cholesterol level is misleadingly reassuring. The counterexamples are those who have high levels of LDL or non-HDL cholesterol, but they have a normal number of ApoB particles. They just have a high content of cholesterol per particle. 
there are now strong and consistent data from a number of studies, starting with Framingham, that these individuals with low particle numbers but relatively high cholesterol are not at high risk. We should not be concerned about their cholesterol level. Wow. A little graphic to illustrate his point. You are looking at two LDL particles, a big one on the left and a smaller one on the right. If you actually convert LDL cholesterol to moles per liter and divide it by LDLP converted to moles per liter, you get on average how many cholesterol molecules are in the average LDL particle in that person. So notice the big one on the left contains 2,600 molecules of cholesterol, and the small one, because it's a smaller dump truck, has 2,150. Now look at this big particle. It also only is depleted. It has 2,150 molecules of cholesterol. Why isn't it carrying the 2,600 molecules like the one on the left? Aha, look at the core. It's very blue. This is a triglyceride-enriched large LDL. It cannot carry that many cholesterol molecules. Finally, let's look at a really small LDL that's packing extra triglycerides. And because of that, it can only pack relatively few molecules of cholesterol, 1,700. So if every person you're looking at here had an LDL cholesterol of 80, who would have potentially increased LDL particle count? Everybody but the one on the left because the more cholesterol depleted your particle is, the more particles you need to carry a given load of cholesterol. That is such a critical physiologic concept to understand. And this is why, what is LDL particle number or ApoB really due to? Not only the size of the particles, but the crucially important triglyceride content of the particles, which no lab is measuring for you. So we bet the house on LDL particle count, which in virtually all the trials where they've compared it against LDL cholesterol and discordant analyses are done, LDLP or ApoB wins. In fact, the first trial that brought that to light was Cromwell's data published in 2007, Framingham Heart Study data, kaplan mile survival curves. The steeper the curve, the worse the survival. So the green and red curves on the top had far better survival than the blue and gold curves on the bottom. What's common to the people who live longer than those who did not? Let's look at the green and red. Low LDL particle count, low LDL particle count. Some of them had low LDL cholesterol, some had high, excuse me, LDL cholesterol. It was LDL particle count that was the common denominator. Let's look at the two worst survival curves high LDL particle count in blue, high LDL particle count in gold. It didn't matter whether the, H the LDL cholesterol was high or the um, LDL cholesterol was low. In fact, if you think about it, that gold curve, the worst survival curve, almost certainly is an insulin resistant or diabetic patient with small triglyceride-rich LDL particles, and that's why they had such high LDL particle counts. So if you had to bet the house, bet it on LDL particle counts, not LDL cholesterol measurements. Let's talk about this concept of discordance. And here's another huge epidemiological trial, MESA. X-axis LDL cholesterol, Y-axis LDL particle counts. Hey, it looks like higher LDLC to higher your LDLP. As a generalization, yes. But now let's take a specific person. Every black, black dot there is an individual person. Let's pick an LDL cholesterol of 100. Hmm, that's the bottom 20th percentile. That's usually not a scary LDL cholesterol in the average person. What might their LDL particle count be? Well, it might be also at the 20th percentile, 1,000. Pretty good. It might be spectacular, 600 nanomoles per liter, or absolute nightmare at 1,900 nanomoles per liter. How would I know that just by looking at LDL cholesterol? You have to do both particle counts and cholesterol measurements. Here's the concept. When LDL cholesterol and LDL particle count are both normal, both high, or both low, they're concordant. They agree with each other and they predict risk equally. However, when LDLC and LDLP are not both normal, high, or low, they're discordant. They don't agree with each other. 
in virtually every study where this type of analysis has been performed, uh, LDLP wins as the best risk factor. So when you hear somebody says, I have a study where it didn't matter LDLP or LDLC, they, nobody has done a discordance analysis in that trial. You believe just all you have to do is make LDL cholesterol less than 50? Here's that study that looked at diabetics again. And you see the LDLP distribution on the x-axis. But remember, over 1,000 would still be residual risk. And these are people whose LDLC was less than 50. My goodness. And yet, 14% still had an abnormally elevated LDL particle count. So spare me the fact that, oh, I drive LDLC down to 50. Fine, you're helping a lot of people with their LDL particle counts, but you're missing some. And how would you know that if you're not measuring the LDL-P? This is maybe the best data of all, recently published within the last couple of years. Peter Toth, and this is looking at alcohol come data, is in a giant cohort. And of people who were aggressively treated to LDL particle count goals and LDL cholesterol goals. Blue are those who got to LDLC goals, red to they, they actually got to the LDLP goals. And it's again a Kaplan Meyer survival curve. Which curve would you rather be on? The red one, obviously. Better survival. How would I know you're probably going to have the better survival? The LP to LDLC, you'd want to be in those who got LDLP to goal, and you would not want to bet your life on, hey, I'm at LDLC goal. Amazing. Back to our little discussion, Schneiderman says this type of discordance analysis does create a head-to-head -head comparison of two markers. One predicts high risk, the other low risk. If risk is high, the first one wins. If risk is low, the other one does. You, there's no debate or ambiguity when you're doing this type of statistical analysis. At least six discordant analyses have now been published, and there's actually more than that now than when this was published, uh, all show ApoB are superior to LDL cholesterol or non-HDL cholesterol. If evidence matters, game, set, match. That should settle it. And here's the take home. In our obsession with risk, we have forgotten the importance of a diagnosis, but accurate diagnosis is the key to effective care. Therefore, the right choice is not ApoB and nothing else, not LDLP and nothing else. It's ApoB or LDLP and everything else. Look at all of the information. Stop doing only lipid profiles and thinking that's going to give you all the info you need and a lot of folks. Mega new study published this year, and it's over 3,000 men and women enrolled between the ages of 18 and 30, young folks, and then they were followed for 25 years, and they had a coronary calcium done. Who developed positivity with coronary calcium? Who did not? And they related it to either the lipid profile or ApoB measurements. You might, you know, I think you'll be very surprised with this unless you've already read the study. They looked at one group who had the lowest risk. They didn't develop much positivity with coronary artery calcium. And they had both low ApoB, low LDLC, and low non-HDLC. All of the markers were concordant. And they, of course, being low, predicted low risk. And that's what happened. All right, how about the people who had nicely normal, low ApoB, but uh-oh, their LDLC and non-HDL cholesterol was elevated. Didn't matter. They also had low risk. So it tells you ApoB is a better way to predict risk than cholesterol measurements. Now let's look at the third quartile. These folks had high ApoB, but yay, they had low LDL and non-HDL cholesterol. Uh-oh, they had high risk. Again, particle number associates more risk than particle cholesterol count. And how about these unfortunate folks? high ApoB, high LDLC, high non-HLC. Again, the parameters are concordant. These are your FHs of the world. And of course, they developed a lot of coronary calcium positivity. But so did the people who had high ApoB with normal cholesterol levels. This just reinforces you have to do both measurements, folks. 
the authors concluded this study adds to the growing body of literature demonstrating similar results across the early adult life course, suggesting that measuring ApoB as a marker of lipid-associated atherogenic risk may help identify the young folks who are going to pay the price within 25 years. Uh, measuring ApoB, you'll know this better than you would just looking at the traditional risk factors. And why is that good? Because you can jump in there earlier with lifestyle and, if needed, pharmacological therapies. That's why you do this type of testing. And in case you hear, oh, those are experimental tests, guidelines don't support them, I've listed eight separate super prestigious organizations, all of which have factored in either ApoB, LDL particle counts, or both into their recommendations or guidelines. So don't believe that poppycock about it being experimental. Nobody recommends it. A lot of people recommend it and think there is big use for these biomarkers. Let's finish up the lipoprotein panel by looking at our high-density lipoproteins. And you see them graphically illustrated. Now, the NMR measures your total HDL particle count, except that it doesn't measure pre-beta HDLs, which are only 5% of the total. So they're pretty much non-contributory. And the reason is NMR measures lipids. There are virtually no lipids in pre-beta HDL particles. So you also know ApoA1 is a measurement. ApoA1 is the structural protein on the surface of every HDL particle. But the problem is, there, unlike ApoB, where there's one ApoB per particle, there can be up to five ApoA1 molecules per HDL particle. So although ApoA1 correlates with HDL particle count, there can be tremendous discordance. You can have high HDL particle counts, low ApoA1, or vice versa. Because none of us know on each and every HDL particle how many molecules of ApoA1 are present. So in general, they correlate. Both have been validated as risk markers. But if I had to bet on either, it's HDL particle count. How about discordance with HDL cholesterol and HDL particle counts? Red or individual women, blue X's are individual men. Let's pick a wonderful HDL cholesterol of 60, right? Uh, in women, <laughs> their HDL particle count might be an incredibly high risk 20 or a super spectacular 55. How about men? HDL cholesterol of 60, yay, yay, yay. Well, wait a minute. Some would have disastrously few HDL particles. Some would have very high HDL particles. How would you know? If you're not measuring HDLP, you would not. This is the National Lipid Association 2013 consensus statement on HDL. Low serum levels of HDL cholesterol have been repeatedly found to be the best predictor of CHD risk in observational studies, more so in men than women. After adjustment for established covariates, high levels of HDL cholesterol in general correlate with low risk whereas low levels with higher risk. But I don't think any of you treat populations. I think all of you treat humans one at a time. So what does it mean in an individual patient? Well, listen, the NLA tells you, you know what, all those studies that slam dunk showed HDL cholesterol is this terrible, terrible risk factor, virtually none of them, until the most recent days, ever adjusted HDL cholesterol for LDL particle count or ApoB. And you're going to see in your own practice that there are not always correlated and virtually all of the people who are having events because of a low HDL cholesterol, they have nightmare ApoB or LDL particle counts. And guess what? Those are accepted treatable goals of therapies, ApoB, LDLC, non-HDL cholesterol. So your therapy in a person with low HDL cholesterol is not necessarily per se to raise HDL cholesterol, it's to blow away ApoB and LDL particle counts. Finally, an incredible little study linking HDL cholesterol with carotid IMT in the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, one of our great studies. Now, on the x-axis, you see they're grouped into people with low HDL cholesterol, less than 42, or high HDL cholesterol, greater than 55 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, now, look at the colors. 
Blue or turquoise, the people had a very low HDL particle count. Red, they had medium numbers of HDL particles. And those in green had a ton of HDL particles. And look at the carotid IMT on the y-axis. Oh, well, I want to be not in that blue or because the IM, well, the IMT of 1,000, a terribly thickened CIMT, was the worst in those who had low HDLP. So I don't want to be there. It was the least in the people who had high HDL particle count. And you know what? It was totally independent of whatever your HDL cholesterol was. Uh, whether it was high, whether it was low, it was HDL particle count that correlated best with CIMT. Great food for thought. So that's about as much as I want to bring you during your lunch hour with uh, giving you too much of a migraine there. I hope you were fascinated by some of the lipid and lipoprotein information and you now are more comfortable and have a better idea how to utilize these markers and also why they're so necessary if you're going to do the best you can in uh, evaluating and treating cardiovascular risk. So I'd love to answer any questions that you might have out there and I thank you so much for uh, giving me part of your lunchtime. <laughs>